So we are looking this afternoon, and I hope we will all feel the benefit of looking at these wonderful scriptures and looking at the events which we now must shortly come to pass when our Lord Jesus Christ will ret return to this earth. And we can only be excited as we see things taking place in the world, which we know from the word of God are leading us to that great day. We've read uh, Ezekiel chapter 38, and we've read it many times, and we know all the details, but we're going to have another look. Um, we have a picture here of Israel newly regathered from the nations, much as we see it today, except it says that Israel will be dwelling safely in the land. And it's at that point that there is a sudden invasion of the land by a mighty army intent on taking spoil. And that's the point at which God intervenes when he goes out and fights for his people, as in the day of battle. And that is the time when our Lord Jesus Christ shall return to this earth, when the nations will know that there is a God in heaven who has planned these things from of old. And the question I'd like to answer in the first part of this talk is, is this... Uh, time of dwelling safely, the result of Christ having returned, or is this not? Is this before uh, Christ returns? And I think if we look carefully at the scriptures, and we'll look at the, the scriptures cut leading up to this chapter as well, we will see um, a clear, I think, a clear picture of what it is that we can expect to see. Now, each of the chapters leading up to uh, Ezekiel 38, from about 36 onwards, describe events that lead to the kingdom. And they're all in connection with Israel, and they're all seen from a slightly different perspective. So, what we will hopefully do is look at some of these verses, and then move on to look at what's happening today with Russia in the Middle East. So let's begin by going back into Ezekiel chapter 36. And here we have a picture um, which begins, Also thou son of man, prophesy unto the mountains of Israel, and say, Ye mountains of Israel, hear the word of the Lord. Thus saith the Lord God, because the enemy hath said against you, Aha, even the ancient places are ours in possession, Therefore prophesy and say, Thus saith the Lord God. So we see then that these mountains of Israel were going to be liberated. And we see that um, this, of course, indeed happened. <clears throat> that the land of Israel was liberated, firstly from Turkish domination, and then finally from the uh, British mandate uh, in the years of the last century. And so it was that uh, as we turn down the chapter, we see in verse 21, But I had pity for mine holy name, which the house of Israel had profaned among the heathen, whither they went. Therefore say unto the house of Israel, Thus saith the Lord God, I do not this for your sakes, O house of Israel, but for mine holy name's sake, which ye have profaned among the heathen, whither ye went. And I will sanctify my great name, which was profaned among the heathen, which ye have profaned in the midst of them. And the heathen shall know that I am the Lord, when the Lord God, when I shall be sanctified in you before their eyes. For I will take you from among the heathen, and gather you out of all countries, and will bring you into your own land. Then will I sprinkle clean water upon you, and ye shall be clean from all your filthiness, and from all your idols will I cleanse you. And a new heart also will I give you, and a new spirit will I put within you. So it's very clear what we're being told from Scripture is that Israel will be regathered, or at least partially regathered, before they recognize the Lord their God, before they've been cleansed 
from the rejection of God over the centuries. And it's marvellous, isn't it, to see how these things are taking place before our eyes. Uh, the Balfour Declaration in 1917 liberated the land. 1948 came the Declaration of the State of Israel following the UN vote the previous year. So we, we've got all these things that have taken place and we see Israel in the land. So they are gathered in unbelief. So let's go on to the <coughs> next chapter, chapter 37. And here we have another remarkable prophecy. And of course, each of these prophecies on their own is remarkable. But you put them all together and we get a remarkable, amazing set of pictures of the regathering of Israel. So chapter 36 has been largely around the land and how it will become fruitful again. And I would say that's partially happened. But now we come to chapter 37, we have the liberation of the people. And we get this well-known picture of the Valley of Dry Bones. And of course, this has been known for centuries, this prophecy. But I would put it to you that it wasn't really clear what it meant until 1945. And here I've got a picture. that There's so many terrible pictures that I could have put up, but I thought I'd put this one up, because this is more in the, in the sense of what we're looking at. Here are orphan children from Bergen-Belsen who have been rescued and here's a, I don't know whether she's a British soldier or what, but she's looking after these children and beginning to rehabilitate them. And of course these are the children that were liberated from the concentration camps that went to Israel and who are now the settlers in the land of Israel. So here you have the liberation of the people. I will open your graves and cause you to come out of your graves and bring you to the land of Israel. And you just think of those terrible images of the, the graves, the mass graves, and the, the most dreadful persecution of the Jews. And yet, to all of that, God was at work to bring his people back. Again, a remarkable prophecy. But look at verse 11. Then he said unto me, Son of man, these bones are the whole house of Israel. Behold, they say, our bones are dried and our hope is lost, and we are cut off for our parts. Therefore prophesy and say unto them, Thus saith the Lord God, Behold, O my people, I will open your graves and cause you to come up out of your graves and bring you into the land of Israel, and ye shall know that I am the Lord when I have opened your graves, O my people, and brought you up out of your graves and shall put my spirit in you and you shall live and I shall place you in your own land then shall ye know that I am the Lord or that I the Lord have spoken it and performed it saith the Lord and I put it to you we are like with the other prophecies we are part way along that it isn't totally fulfilled yet could you really say that God's spirit is in the nation of Israel at the moment and I would put it to you that it isn't and they've stood up and you could call them a very great army but not in the sense that we have in Ezekiel that there will be a day when they will recognize their God and then his spirit will be in them and they'll be recognized as God's people in the earth so we've, we're part way along we haven't quite got there yet but we can marvel that we have got this far and that is remarkable isn't it so we look forward to the time when the people will recognise their God. <clears throat> and so we come to chapter 38. And obviously we have this picture in verse 11. And thou shalt say, I will go up to the land of unwalled villages. And here's a picture um, of, I think it was from the Golan. And you can see looking out over this wonderfully fruitful land with its wonderful irrigation systems and so on. It has been blessed, but I don't think that's anything compared to what it will be in the future in the kingdom of God. But nevertheless, 
Here you have a picture of a land at rest. So could you say that that fulfills the requirements in verse 11? And thou shalt say, I will go out to the land of unwalled villages, I will go to them that are at rest, that dwell safely, all of them dwelling without walls, having neither bars nor gates. And I have to say, that isn't the case yet, is it? Israel has got this massive wall dividing Israelis and Palestinians. And although there's a comparative uh, safety in what they're doing and how they're living, it's nevertheless not really in this spirit of dwelling safely without walls, having neither bars nor gates. So again, I would put it to you that we're not quite there yet. You know, we've got so far, but there are things yet to happen. And what I'd like to do is just list a few other things which I think help us to see the situation that has to happen. And it's very interesting, isn't it? If you look at the map of Israel and you look at the map of the nations around it, then you look at these nations that come up, and we'll look at them in a bit more detail later on, not a single one of the local nations is mentioned. Now, isn't that surprising? What about the Palestinians? What about the uh, Syrians? They're just not there. What you do have is nations that are further out, the outer ring of nations. Persia, Ethiopia, Libya. You've got uh, Gog and Magog, Meshach and Tubal. You've got Tugama and you've got Goma. You've got all those countries, and we will identify them, before long. But the point is they're all much further away from Israel. So what is it then that has to happen first? Clearly there has to be some, I'll call it a showdown if you like, with those enemies that are still there. And obviously we've seen that Israel, while it dwells safely, they're not cleansed yet. And there's an interesting verse in chapter 39 verse 6. And I will send a fire on Magog, and among them that dwell carelessly in the isles, and they shall know that I am the Lord. Now, you might read that and say, well, there you are. There's Israel's dwelling safely, and Magog's dwelling carelessly. Well, actually, in the Hebrew, it's exactly the same. So this idea of dwelling safely could mean dwelling safely and not having to worry at all about anything, or it could be dwelling carelessly and not being aware that sudden destruction is coming. And that reminds us of that verse in Thessalonians. When they cry, peace, peace, and there is no peace, then cometh sudden destruction. So it seems to me that we see Israel dwelling safely in the sense of dwelling carelessly, that there will come a time when they've overcome their enemies, and yet they still don't recognize God. They think they've achieved what they've done in their own strength. And that's very much the ethos of modern Israel, isn't it? They've done some wonderful things. I was reading something the other day about some... uh, They're developing eye drops to help people not have glasses. You know, where where they get these ideas from, I don't know. But it is... They are a remarkable nation. But they're very, very strong in their own strength. And they have to be brought to the point where they've got no one else to turn to, not the United States, not Britain, not anybody, except the Lord their God. So, chapter 39, verse 7. And there we read, So will I make my holy name known in the midst of my people Israel, and I will not let them pollute my holy name any more, and the heathen shall know that I am the Lord, the Holy One in Israel. And that's in connection with God's intervention against Gog and Magog and the invading army. And that is what will make them turn. That is the turning point. Once they see that, and once they realise that there is a God in heaven who has delivered them, that is the point in which they will, God will make his holy name known in the midst of of his people Israel. So if we carry on to chapter 39 and verse 21. And I set my glory among the heathen, and all the heathen shall see my judgment that I have executed 
and my hand that I have laid upon them, so shall the house of Israel know that I am the Lord their God from that day and forward. And the heathen shall know that the house of Israel went into captivity for their iniquity because they trespassed against me. Therefore hid I my face from them and gave them into the hand of their enemies, so fell they all by the sword. Do you notice what it said? Verse 22. So shall the house of Israel know that I, I am the Lord, their God, from that day and forward. They don't know it before. They don't know it now. So, if, if, if you think we're building up this picture of Israel being very successful, and, and it's already successful. It's got oil wealth now, and I, and I don't want to trespass on, on the milestones, but you know, you see that picture. And when the enemies of Israel, the local enemies, are overcome and the walls come down, that's the time we've got to watch, because that is the time when they will be invaded and will have this final battle. Verse 30, uh, chapter 39, verse 25. Therefore thus saith the Lord God, now will I bring again the captivity of Jacob and have mercy upon the whole house of Israel and will be jealous for my holy name. After that they have borne their shame and all their trespasses whereby they have trespassed against me when they dwelt safely in their land and none made them afraid. Now the problem with that verse, 26, although it says very clearly in the AV that they're ashamed of their attitude when they were dwelling safely, some other versions translate that, that they will be ashamed when they dwell safely, afterwards in other words. But I think looking at what we've already seen, surely it means that they will be ashamed of their attitude, their self contained attitude, their ig ignorance of the way that God has looked after them and when they realise that God has indeed intervened on their behalf their current arrogance has to be humbled as indeed no flesh shall glory in his presence it isn't just the Jews, it's all nations have to be humbled before God uh, before we um, pass on to go, I'd like just to compare a few other uh, passages which talk about the earthquake. Because to me, that's a, a fairly key event that happens at this time. So, um, Ezekiel 38, verse 19. <clears throat> For in my jealousy and in the fire of my wrath have I spoken. Surely in that day there shall be a great shaking in the land of Israel so that the fishes of the sea and the fowls of the heaven and the beasts of the field and all creeping things that creep upon the earth and all the men that are upon the face of the earth shall shake at my presence and the mountains shall be thrown down and the steep places shall fall and every wall shall fall to the ground so when God intervenes to overthrow Gog and Magog and all those nations that have had hooks in their jaws to bring them down there's going to be a terrific earthquake and I'd just like to look very quickly at uh, the other references Joel 3 we just go to Joel 3 again another well known description of God fighting for his people verse 14 of Joel 3 multitudes, multitudes in the valley of decision for the day of the Lord is near in the valley of decision the sun and the moon shall be darkened and the stars shall withdraw their shining, the Lord also shall roar out of Zion and utter his voice from Jerusalem and the heavens and the earth shall shake, but the Lord will be the hope of his people and the strength of the children of Israel so here's God intervening Here's the earthquake, and here's the point at which they realise that their only strength is in the Lord their God, not in other human agencies. So that's Joel 3. Shall we go to Zechariah 14? Again, this has to be a very, very quick walk through these other uh, prophecies. Zechariah 14, 
and the first four verses. Again, well-known words. Behold, the day of the Lord cometh, and thy spoil shall be divided in the midst of thee. For I will gather all nations against Jerusalem to battle. And the city shall be taken, and the houses rifled, and the women ravished, and half of the city shall go forth into captivity. And the residue of the people shall not be cut off from the city. Then shall the Lord go forth and fight against those nations as when he fought in the day of battle. And his feet shall stand in that day upon the Mount of Olives, which is before Jerusalem, on the east, and the Mount of Olives shall cleave in the midst thereof toward the east and toward the west. And there shall be a very great valley, and half of the mountain shall be removed toward the north and half of it toward the south. And ye shall flee to the valley of the mountains, for the valley of the mountain shall reach unto Azel. Yea, ye shall flee, like as he fled from before the earthquake in the days of Uzziah, king of Judah. And the Lord thy God, my God, shall come, and all the saints with thee. So here's God's intervention. Here's the earthquake. But note, in this chapter we learn a bit more that we don't learn in Ezekiel. Namely, that Jerusalem is taken. And that's the point where all seems lost. That's the point at which God intervenes. And his agent, the Lord Jesus, returns to this earth. And I feel sure this is, this is the time at which, as it said in chapter 12, they shall look on me whom they've pierced and shall mourn for him as one mourneth for his only son. And it talks about the fountain, verse, uh, chapter 13, verse 1, in that day shall be a fountain open to the house of David and to the inhabitants of Jerusalem for sin and for uncleanness. So here's the cleansing of the nation. Here's the realisation that the Lord is their God. This is the point at which they become truly God's people with his spirit upon them. So let's then turn to the fourth in this short series, Revelation 16. Again, well-known words. The drying up of the Euphrates to lead, to allow the kings of the east. And the three unclean spirits like frogs. But I'd like really to point you to verse 16. And he gathered them together into a place called in the Hebrew tongue Armageddon which I always think is interesting because that means that the Hebrew tongue will have to be spoken which it has revived since the work of Eliezer ben Yehuda back in the early part of the 19th century and then we read verse 17 the seventh angel poured out his vial into the air and there came a great voice out of the temple of heaven from the throne saying it is done and there were voices and thunders and lightnings there was a great earthquake such as was not since men were upon the earth, so mighty an earthquake and so great. And then we read of the great fall city falling down, the destruction of Babylon. So again, you see, it, it's the same set of events. You have the nations coming against Jerusalem. You have the huge earthquake and the intervention of God and the salvation of his people. But note verse 15. Behold, I come as a thief. Blessed is he that watcheth and keepeth his garments, lest he walk naked and they see his shame. And, and I think, and I'm, I'm sure there are many brethren who may agree with me, I hope, that the Lord Jesus does actually come at that point. But not revealed to Israel or to the nation, but to the saints. So sometime between Israel dwelling safely and that final invasion, the Lord Jesus appears as a thief. And I think that's a very comforting verse, because actually what it's showing us is that the saints will not have to endure that final terrific destruction. They will be with the Lord Jesus Christ, to be revealed when Israel is saved, and when they recognise their Messiah. So just to summarise then, um, it seems that there has to be a showdown with the surrounding nations for Israel to dwell in, in the future carelessly or safely. Then 
Gog attacks. Jerusalem is taken, God intervenes, and Christ returns. So that's what we are looking at. And we will examine now today's events and today's arrangement of nations in the light of that Bible prophecy. And I'd like to uh, put up a chart. And those who were here, I don't know how many years ago it was, Brother Peter, but I actually put this up, you know, eight or nine years ago. Um, But I don't think it's changed because it's actually based on uh, the writings of early authorities who identify these places mentioned in Ezekiel with uh, nations which now have a direct correlation with today. So you can actually get back to who they actually were. So we've got Gog and Magog. Magog um, was thought at the time by Josephus to be the Scythians. Uh, We'll talk about that again in a little while. We've got a slide on that. And that is really South Russia and Ukraine. Now that's interesting, isn't it? There's trouble with Ukraine. and We'll look at that. Then we've got Rush. Rush is the Hebrew word for head. So this Rush is the head or the chief prince. And there were a group called the Rosh or the Tauri, which obviously has a link with Russian. If you look at Russian postage stamps, you will see Roshia. That is what they call themselves now. And Meshach, Herodotus saw that as Mosky, which we understand is Moscow. And Tubal, Herodotus again, identifies them as the Tiberoi, who are Tobol in Siberia. So you've got all this Russian link, and I I think we've trodden this ground a number of times in the past, and you can see where these nations have their origins. Then Persia, that's probably the easiest of the list, because until the 1970s, Persia was called Persia. But when the Shah was overthrown by the Islamic Revolution, the Shiite Revolution, it became known as Iran. And then we have... Ethiopia. Now, Ethiopia, um, <clears throat> there is a, a nation called Ethiopia, but it's not the Ethiopia of Scripture. E- the Ethiopia of Scripture was to the south of Egypt, and it was at the point where the Blue Nile and the White Nile joined at Khartoum. And that now is in North Sudan, which is a strongly Islamic state. So we'll look at. Uh, Ethiopia or Sudan briefly as we go on then Libya Libya was in in the time of um, Josephus it meant North Africa and of course there is a Libya and that seems to answer fairly closely to the Libya of scripture and then we have Goma and there's a link via Josephus and Herodotus via the Simurai and the Gauls so the, the, the people who lived in Asia Minor, who became known as the Galatians, who uh, were obviously where the Apostle Paul wrote a letter, um, a branch of them went into Europe. And these Gauls settled in France. They went around Europe, various places. So the, the nearest to Goma would seem to be Western Europe. And then to Gama. Again, to Gama is identified as Armenia and the Phrygians, which of course is now part of Turkey and possibly part of Georgia as well. So we can see the modern equivalents of these nations. And so what we're going to do now is look at what they're doing. I want to start with Russia. And because we're talking about Gog and his armies, I thought, well, let's look at Russia's military standing. And they love having their big parade in Red Square every year and here the Russian soldiers lined up. Now it's true to say that with the fall of the Soviet Union, communist Russia, uh, the amount of money they spend on defense has plummeted and until a certain point in time and that corresponds with the uh, President Putin coming to power. And you can see what's happened since defence spending has gone up. It's gone up very sharply. Um, and it's now well over 100, million US do- 100 billion US dollars. 
which is still a, a, a drop in the ocean compared to the US budget, but it's the third largest spending on military hardware and military power in the world after China and America. So Russia is certainly back in the game. It's also worth saying, of course, that um, the current Russian state has inherited something like 7,000 nuclear warheads from the USSR, which is about the same number that America has got. And although there have been various strategic arms limitation treaties, that was really to stop new ones being made, it didn't really do much about the current inventory. So we've still got enough nuclear bombs to totally destroy the world. So that's the position Russia is in. But of course, although they might have a smaller budget, they're using it very wisely. And they're developing hypersonic missiles. Now, I, I had to look that up, I must admit. And apparently, hypersonic missiles travel at more than five times the speed of sound. And we're talking, in some cases, about 15 or 20 times the speed of sound. So missiles that go so incredibly fast, they can outrun virtually anything. And Russia now claims, and of course this is Putin talking very ebulliently, he claims that they have mus uh, missiles that can strike the US mainland within five minutes which is hardly the time to react. So America may have all this military might, but if Russia can get in first, then they have a significant advantage. And the US have admitted they won't have missiles like that for another five years or so. So I wonder whether there's a, a window opening up where Russia is more advanced in this type of warfare. We have to wait and see. The Russians are obviously uh, well into their missiles. Um, this is the well-known S-400 surface-to-air missile system. And each of these rather strange-looking canisters contains probably more than one missile. We'll see this crops up again later on. But these um, missiles can go up to Mach 14, 14 times the speed of sound. Remarkable. And they're there, they're based on the ground, and they're there to destroy um, bombers, fighters, cruise missiles, ballistic missiles. And of course, the idea of them is, if anybody tries to fly any weapon against them, they send their missiles up and they destroy them. I suppose a bit like Israel's Iron Dome system, but, but at a much bigger, more developed scale. And they say that their next generation will be in operation soon. This is the S500. It's like a new version of your laptop computer, isn't it? You know, the, oh, I've got an S400. No, I'm, I'm going to have an S500, and that's even bigger and better. And the point about these is they will even destroy stealth fighters, which means that America's chief defence, or, or their chief attack, should I say, their, their uh, aircraft, which are stealth, they can get past and through radar detection, that won't stop the S-500s getting at them. So somehow or other, the Russians seem to be stealing a march in that area. And here we have Russia's first stealth fighter, which is about to be dis deployed, which means that they will have the same capabilities as the United States in terms of being able to evade detection and get to the target. And now the good old Admiral Kuznetsov. I always have a bit of a difficulty pronouncing that. Uh, this actually, it's not quite as grand as it looks. Russia only has one aircraft carrier. Um, you might say, well, perhaps they don't need them if they, um, if they got all these missiles. Um, the US has 10 aircraft carriers. Britain is just uh, renewing it's got one new aircraft carrier and it's got another one coming along soon. And this was actually a, f a picture of when the Admiral Kuznetsov came through the English Channel and that's HMS York shadowing it, keeping a close eye on it. Um, and this aircraft carrier um, obviously carries planes, fighters which have nuclear capability. And, of course, the, the Americans' plan is that there's ten of them, they can deploy them wherever they like. 
So what do the Russians do if they've only got one? Well, they've got 72 submarines. And it's the same policy, really, as America and the US, that if you've got a submarine, it can quietly hide at the bottom of the ocean, and it can go in, move into place and deploy its nuclear missiles at a time when the enemy isn't suspecting it. Interestingly, America has 71 submarines, and Britain has 10. So that just gives you a rough idea of where Russian is, Russia is in the scale of things. And some, some other interesting facts about the Russian army. Uh, since 2009, in other words, since Putin has really taken over, um, there's been a significant reorganisation of the Russian armed forces. Um, they've slimmed down the top-heavy central command by 40%. Um, they've slimmed down the number of military schools where the soldiers are trained. So instead of 65 military schools, all saying something slightly different, they've now got 10 systematic military training establishments, which sounds to me as if they've really gone into properly organising themselves. The Air Force has been reorganised from regiments to an air base system, and of course the, Ameri the uh, Russians have set up an air base in Syria, and... Of course, that means they're much more local. They're much more able to respond quickly to what's going on. They've increased their defence spending by 40% since 2012, which I think is more than that now. This was uh, about two or three years old, and as we've said, the third biggest spender in the world. And the net result is a far more efficient, well-resourced defence organisation. 62% of the weapons of the Russian Army and Navy and Air Force are new, up-to-date equipment. They've been thoroughly reorganising themselves. So that's the Russian armed forces. It's, <coughs> Putin has certainly bounced Russia back into the big lead, league after the fall of communist rule. Now what about uh, Russians' neighbours? Now we all know, of course, about the trouble with Ukraine and the way that Russia went into Crimea um, against the will of the Ukrainian state and indeed against the will of most uh, countries of the world. Uh, that was in April 2014. And it's said that about 10,000 people have been killed in this war that's been going on in the background um, in East eastern Donetsk and the Luhansk region. So these are the, the eastern parts of Ukraine. And here is the, the famous bridge over the Kerch Strait, uh, which the Russians have built. It's illegal, actually, to box in another state. That's against the international conventions. But of course, Russia do it anyway. It joins the Russian mainland with Crimea by, via this double bridge. There's a railway link which in this picture wasn't finished, and the road link. And all of the shipping in the Sea of Azov, which goes then into the Black Sea and the other way round, has to go underneath the central spans of that bridge, which essentially means the Russians now have got a gate. And if they decide they want to shut it, they will shut it. And some of uh, Ukraine's biggest ports are in that Sea of Azov, round the corner, and they can't get out. And so it is then that um, there, was a, there was trouble last November when uh, the Russians intercepted a Ukrainian vessel. They rammed it, they took sailors prisoner, and they actually put a tanker across the entrance to that bridge to stop people coming to and fro. So Russia really has got its hands around the throat of Ukraine. And there's another issue that's uh, been going on for the last few months, and that is the Russian Orthodox Church and the split with what is now the Ukrainian Orthodox Church. And here we've got the Patriarch Bartholomew of Constantinople handing the tomos, or decree, to the Metropolitan Bishop, I suppose he is. He's in uh, Metropolitan... His name is Epiphan Epiphanius of the Ukrainian Orthodox Church. So in other words, here is the document that says you are now independent as 
a church which of course is against the will of the Russian Orthodox Church which until recently had control over the Ukrainian and their patriarch Kirill and President Putin are both strongly against this move and so you might ask the question well, I wonder whether this is the pretext that will lead Russia further into Ukraine and now a little bit of history <coughs> here are some Scythians now if you remember we saw that um, I think it was Herodotus identified um, Magog with the Scythians which were based in Ukraine that area around the uh, river Dnieper and the Scythians actually did invade the Middle East in 625 BC and got as far as Egypt it was a very short and sharp invasion and I wonder whether this is a, a sort of prototype for this latter day invasion these people coming down with with uh, armor and swords on horses now that's the picture we get in scripture of this future invasion and that again adds weight to the idea that Ukraine has to be amongst those who come down with Russia so one way or another Russia will force Ukraine to join up well that's Ukraine what about Tagama or Turkey so here's the Yavuz Sultan Selim Bridge over the Bosphorus now I don't know what your geography is like but the Bosphorus is the narrow channel which uh, is essentially the waterway between the Black Sea and what leads through the center of Tur or the edge of Turkey down into the Mediterranean and that is the channel that President Putin's navy has to go through if it wants to leave its Black Sea bases and get into the Mediterranean <coughs> if that is blocked to Putin he'd have to go all the way around Norway and all the way around Britain all the way around Spain to get into the Mediterranean so this is a crucial waterway as far as Putin is concerned and I think this explains why Putin is so keen on making friends with Turkey if you remember there was trouble a few years ago when uh, the Turks shot down a Russian plane because it had strayed into their airspace and there was big trouble at the time but Putin's got over it and he's now trying to be as friendly as possible to uh, the Turkish just one thing before we leave that this Yavuz Sultan Selim bridge now I, I'm one of these people that quite likes these links and that was actually the name that the Turks gave to the Russian uh, the German warship Gurban when it was transferred to the Turkish Navy in 1914 and that's what brought Turkey into the war on the side of Germany which of course is what led eventually to the liberation of Palestine because Britain was on the other side in the war and took Palestine under General um, I've forgotten his name now but uh, they invaded in 1917 didn't they and so this flagship had that same name so I wonder whether there's any reason why they've called it that obviously this Sultan was some big figure in Turkish history and so going on we see here President Erdogan shaking hands with Vladimir Putin last April about a year ago um, as they broke the soil to build a nuclear power station so here's Putin doing as much as he can to help Turkey and it's not just nuclear power this growing alliance is taking shape in terms of the Turk stream gas pipeline now what we have here is the pipeline and it's only just recently in November broke land so it's just reached the Turkish coast a little bit away there's the Bosphorus here that channel just here and <coughs> I believe there's still discussion as to whether they're going to go from there into Greece or whether they're going to go into Bulgaria and into Europe that way there are two pipelines one is for Turkish use the other 
is for European use. And here again you see, energy is power. And Putin knows that if he is supplying gas, and we'll come across another example of this shortly, if he's supplying gas to Europe, he's got them in his pocket. He knows that he'll be able to command some sort of loyalty from them, or he'll just turn the gas off. So here you have the Turk Stream gas pipeline. And here's another big one. I think this is quite significant. We, we all know what these are now, don't we? S-400s. They're the missiles. And Turkey has decided, it, Turkey's been umming and ahhing for months, and it would appear they have finally decided to buy these missiles from Russia, rather than buy the equivalent missile system from the USA. Now that's a big thing, because Turkey is a member of NATO, and therefore, in theory, should be part of the American camp. But it's very clear that Turkey is moving away from that. In fact, if you just go back to the analogy with those warships in 1914, Turkey goes to the highest bidder. And in 1914, they're all set to join Britain and France, but the Germans supplied these warships, and so they changed their mind and they joined Germany. So here you've got almost exactly the same characteristic. Um, they've been offered missiles from America, but now Putin has got in there first and he's encouraged them to buy his missiles. And of course, in turn, um, the, uh, the Americans don't want him to have the latest American jets, the latest American fighters, because they'll soon learn what the weaknesses are if they've got a missile system that can shoot them down. So they daren't sell planes to Turkey now. So that immediately pushes Turkey further away from the US camp. <clears throat> so we've looked at Tagama. We've looked at Magog. Now let's look at Iran, formerly Persia. Here's President Rouhani. Um, now, of course, the, the, the thing that he has in common with Putin is that they both are suffering from sanctions from America. Uh, Rouhani, because of the nuclear um, installations that he's got and America's refusal, particularly Trump's refusal to rip up the, the agreement and to say, no, we're going to carry on with the sanctions until you've destroyed your nuclear capability. And Russia, of course, because of Crimea. So they're both under US sanctions. And that, of course, in turn, has meant that they've built up a partnership between them. The supply of military hardware, military cooperation. Uh, they've, they've got a trade agreement coming into place, the, the Eurasian Economic Communi Community. So the, the sort of Russian equivalent of the EU which, of course, we know in the case of Putin, he wants to get people so much enmeshed in Russia that they can't do anything else. So he's drawing them into his web. <coughs> and, of course, we've already seen the picture of nuclear power as well. He's supplying the technology for nuclear power. So there's all these connections going on between Russia and Iran. And here's another significant step. Now, just bear in mind that a few years ago, uh, President Erdogan and uh, President Rouhani, so in other words, Iran and Turkey, were by no means friendly to each other. They were on opposite sides. They, they, they disagreed on the, the Armenian question. The Turks want to wipe the Armenians out, and have done since the First World War and be up before, whereas the Iranians are more on their side. And so there you have a picture of Putin. He's such an amazing diplomat, really. He goes out and he befriends people, and he's brought them together. And although it's not going to be an easy ride, here you've got three of the main protagonists of Ezekiel 38. Isn't that amazing? And this only has happened in the last year or two. Now we talk a little bit about the Syrian civil war. Now, I don't know whether you can make that out. It wouldn't make any difference if you had it printed out on your lap. 
it's so complicated you've got all of these people involved and he's helping him but he's against him he's helping him but he's against that one and so on all the way around it's, the, it's, it's one of the most complicated scenarios you can imagine and in the middle everybody is against IS or Daesh and they think they've more or less wiped them out now but of course what's been the net result of all that Russia has won a massive strategic victory America came in and they they uh, did quite a bit to help get rid of IS they wanted to support the free Syrian army they were against the Syrian government Russia all along has been in support of the Syrian government against the free Syrian army and so you've got all these other participants and in the end it's Russia that's been far more effective at sorting the situation out than America so who is the strong man in the Middle East now? it's not Trump it's Putin Russia is now seen as the source of stability for the Middle East it's Russia that you turn to if you want some help and of course particularly states which are um, not really viewed favorably by America because they've they've done something or there's a human rights uh, human rights violation you know sanctions are imposed very easily and therefore these countries are out of the pale and Putin welcomes them with open arms so Russia is the big winner in the Middle East. Russia is in the Middle East and is there to stay. Not the least because um, he's got an air base now and he's also got um, a naval base as well. So this is the Haimimim, if I've said it correctly, air base um, in the Syrian Arab Republic and guess what's being unloaded? S-400s the missile system and so you have then um, a big presence and they've bought a 49 year lease on this air base and similarly for the Tartus naval base which they're enlarging as well so Russia isn't going to go away very quickly it's settling down in the Middle East with bases in key positions and they now are in an amazingly strong position and it is the surprise in a way is how quickly America's dominance has started to crumble in the Middle East okay well we're, we're getting through the list bit by bit let's look now at Sudan as we said biblical Ethiopia here's President Omar al-Bashir uh, talking to President Putin and when uh, al-Bashir um, was recently encouraged to go to Syria and try and talk to the Syrians um, I think there was perhaps a little bit of reluctance on his part he's got some a price on his head he's wanted as an international criminal but guess who supplied a plane for him it was President Putin he flew him to Syria and brought him back again Russia is Sudan's biggest investment partner 87% of Sudan's arms are from Russia and Putin sees Sudan as a global ally on the African continent and almost certainly they will develop another naval base at Port Sudan which is on the Red Sea coast of Sudan so you've got a, a very interesting developing relationship there as well and then we come to Libya well that's about as complicated as Syria and um, of course Libya was one united um, nation under Colonel Gaddafi and with the help of the Americans Gaddafi was deposed and now it would appear the Americans have walked away and what have they left well they've left um, many factions the the uh, the pinkish color um, which seems to have most of the land area is owned or ruled by the House of Representatives of the Libyan National Army then you've got the Government of National Accord the Libyan Shield Force with the green areas then you've got the National Salvation Government with the dark green areas then you've got ISIL or ISIS or Daesh 
with the grey areas, some key places that they've still got. And of course, what's Putin doing? Well, he's going to talk to all these factions. He's making friends with them. He's trying to help them. He's presenting himself, I'm the person that can sort it all out. Just come to us and we will get things straight. Don't go to America, they'll leave me in a mess. I'm a friend in crisis. So he's wending his magic web again. Now what about Goma? What about Europe? Well, there's a charming man delivering some flowers to Mrs. Merkel. You can see this is how he does it. He's, uh, and she's obviously quite flattered by having a nice bunch of flowers. Um, Germany uh, is one of the nations of Europe, obviously, and they've imposed sanctions on Russia. But that hasn't stopped Germany being a key customer of Russian gas. And Germany is actually the, the world's largest importer of natural gas, and most of that comes from Russia. And apart from what they already get, they want to double the amount of gas coming from Russia, and the Russians are building this Nord Stream gas pipeline down uh, under the sea, and it will land, hit land in Germany to supply them with energy. So you can see that Germany is going to be fully beholden to Russia. They may on the surface have sanctions, but Russia will hold them by the throat when it comes to it. And interestingly enough, uh, do you remember Gerhard Schröder? He was the German president before Angela Merkel. Gerhard Schröder is chairman of the Russian state-controlled oil producer, Rosneft. He's a very close confidant of Mr. Putin. He's also chairman of Nord Stream 2, the gas pipeline, which will double the gas supplies in a few years. So I think that he's got the Germans in his pocket. And you can see why they will be able to find it very difficult to resist when the time comes. Well, we've, we've done a bit of a survey. We've not been able to go into any great detail, but we've tried to do a survey of most of those nations in the list. So let's go back to our list. And I've put down, and it's, it's always foolish to make any predictions, so I don't really want to make predictions, but I want to, what I call a traffic light analysis. Who's ready to go? Who's not ready yet? And who is almost ready. So green indicates they're ready to go. You see Russia, Moscow, Tobol, Iran. You see these nations obviously have facilities in the Middle East already. And Iran, Iran's been ready to destroy Israel for years. There's nothing new in that. And bear in mind, if the reason that they dwell safely or carelessly is that they have overcome the local Palestinian neighbours and, and so on, who are the ones who are likely to shout the most against that? Well, it's going to be Persia, Iran, it's going to be the EU, who are always for, uh, call foul when Israel does anything. It's going to be Turkey. Erdogan is, is vitriolic against Israel and, and the things that it's doing with the Palestinians. It's the very nations you expect. And that's what we see when Israel does anything. And then we've got some nations which are sort of teetering. You've got Ethiopia or Sudan. And clearly there's a developing relationship there. You've got Libya. And there's clearly more work needed there. But it's, he's working on it. And then you've got Turkey, which is almost in the Russian camp. It's not quite. He's, they're still members of NATO, but only just. And we've seen that situation developing over the years. So what has yet to happen? Well, Ukraine. Somehow or other, Russian will, Russia will bring them into his orbit. Goma, Western Europe. Again, we can see reasons why they might move into the Russian orbit, but it isn't there yet. And finally, Israel are not yet dwelling safely. That's something that we await 
and we keep reading our newspapers and watching our TV flashes on the news. And so we're going to finish with that lovely quote, Behold, he cometh with clouds, and every eye shall see him. So our Lord Jesus Christ will come soon, and all these things are fulfilled.